Um, Mumilak, it's so great to have you here. I can't tell you how um, how inspiring you are to me and I think so many people. Uh, and I'm just, I'm so excited to have you here, but I know we only have you here for about like 30 or 40 minutes. So I wanna jump right into things. Um, but the, like I was sharing with our, with our community here who's joining us, um, there's two major areas I was hoping to touch on. One is looking into what does Canada Day look like this year for you, um, for non-Indigenous folk? And then I think the second part being, now what? After everything that we know um, collectively as a society now in a way that we haven't in the past, how do non-Indigenous folk uh, exist in solidarity and like take action around that? Because solidarity isn't just like skipping Canada Day, it's it's ongoing, it's continuous, it's, it's um, showing up. So um, yeah, I guess maybe we can start with that a little bit and, and I'm just so excited to have you here. Yeah, thank you for, for having me. Thank you for sharing the space and no need to be nervous. I, I mean, I know it can be a little bit, uh, you know, easier said than done, but I tell my staff uh, all the time, I know it looks uh, a certain way on the outside, but I am an individual just like you using my <laughs> position to the best of my ability. Um, so I think uh, jumping right into the conversation around Canada Day, is one I've even been struggling to figure out how do you talk about this? How do you talk about this multi-layer complex situation and to be constantly put in a position where you're expected to answer questions, share your experience, to be an open book. And uh, I think there's a lot of things that um, allies really miss the mark on. And um, and so we have spaces like this where we can share um, things that allies can do. And I think um, it's one thing to say, cancel Canada Day. And I, and I think uh, another really important part of the conversation to have is that Indigenous peoples have their different perspectives. I'm going to have such different perspectives from other Inuit. Uh, there's things like uh, my face tattoos. I, I really don't get into the meaning of because Inuit perceive them differently. We don't. There, There is commonalities, mm -hmm. of course, but um, there isn't uh, a common belief, belief per se. And uh, that's fine. Indigenous people can have their own perspectives, their own beliefs, their own values. Indigenous peoples across the country are so different. Uh, <laughs> and first, the First Nations experience in itself, I mean, that has such an immense amount of things that had happened from one group to the next, let alone the Southern and Northern experience. So I think people think that they know a lot, but we're just really scratching the surface and seeing the tip of the iceberg. Uh, mm. I was actually having a conversation with one of my colleagues today, and we are trying to figure out, you know, what what is next? How how do we how do you start dismantling or breaking down a system that oppresses uh, people by the thousands, by the hundreds of thousands that have for generations, for decades? Uh, that have done really horrible things and continue to. Um, the truth uh, isn't out. The truth hasn't been made available. And we know that the federal institution has been responsible for atrocities and for horrors. And so I think it's, it is one thing to say cancel Canada Day, but how do we cancel that history? How do we cancel that, those things that have happened uh, Really, Canada has been built off the backs and the displacement of Indigenous peoples. Canada has used Inuit as human flagpoles and forcibly relocated them. And we have never seen basic human rights. We have seen a group of individuals forced into a situation uh, through a number of tactics. Uh, through a number of very sneaky ways, through a number mm -hmm. of very dark ways. And we haven't even really come to um, a place, I think, of healing in our own communities where even amongst ourselves, uh, we may or may not be ready to, to share some of these things. 
and uh, but to at least have the tools to survive have at least have basic human rights clean drinking water adequate housing and affordable living that's all we're asking when historically we have been put wrongfully so into places that nobody ever should have been and what we're seeing now are immense amount of poverty violence suicide uh, all of these horrific things in a place that you don't think is is possible but as indigenous people as the first peoples of this country uh, we know that relationship has never been a good one it continues to be a bad one and um, we're just asking for basic human rights we're just mm. asking to have uh, equal opportunity and a, and a shot at that and uh, I think even that understanding and that history is something that not a lot of people really grasp you're just seeing uh, some numbers and some quite frankly like this is harsh to put up some bodies uh, those were names those were children those were families those were you know potential parents and knowledge keepers and they're they never got that chance um this is so so much more than uh, just the 751 and the 215 we keep talking about um mm -hmm. there's so much history here that uh, we're just starting to unravel yeah i think my like i'm I'm 30 and like my introduction to Indigenous communities didn't happen until I took a university course. Um, it wasn't taught to us in school and if it was, it was very like, like just very Victor washed, whitewashed sort of history account of it. And it, um, it wasn't until my first year of undergrad that um, I took a course that focused on Indigenous health. And I didn't understand why at first. I was like, why does this have to be an entire course? What, like, what's going on here? And I, and I think that's what I've, from that moment, what I've really been dealing with is the fact that we've been, none of these things were done by accident. They were intentionally designed for us to be left out, like not to know. Um, these, the systems that have caused harm historically were not accidentally causing harm. They were set up that way to cause harm. And it's not a historical issue because it's still happening to, to, in varying degrees to this day. Um, and I think, I always think about that quote of like, you can't heal where you've been harmed or where you've continued to be harmed. Like, uh, and I think about indigenous communities and how they're still facing so many barriers and so many like systemic barriers um, and barriers are designed that way that prevents them from being able to get the same thing that if anyone else is a non-Indigenous person was like, if an entire community that was non-Indigenous was going through that, we would be making so much noise about it. Um, people would be paying attention. Like, I can't think of a community where we would just ignore boil advisories for this long. Um, and I, I admit that like, I wasn't the greatest solid, like ally, active ally around this issue. And that's something I'm trying to learn more about. Um, and part of that has been through, unfortunately, these numbers that you're talking about coming up and like having to grapple with that and better understand it. But I think what I keep coming back to is that like not celebrating Canada this day to me really feels similar to like, it's, I feel like it's like the citizen equivalent to lowering the flag, like flags in the sense that by itself, it doesn't really do enough. Um, it has to be paired with ongoing solidarity. And I'm wondering what that looks like. Um, because we put together seven steps, but I know those aren't, like, that's not it. There's, like, many, many more steps to go. Those are just, like, a starter step, I guess. Um, how, like, what does active allyship look like um, if it's done right? Yeah, I think there's quite a few things to touch on. I think that the way we speak in language is really important. I try and say majority Indigenous communities because when we say Indigenous communities, we're ignoring the fact that there are non-Indigenous peoples there. And for me, in my life, that's ignoring half of myself. My mom is not Indigenous. And uh, that's not something that I, I choose in my life, but it's something that is, is still part of it. We can't ignore the fact that there are non-Indigenous people here now. To me, it's important to say majority Indigenous communities, mm -hmm. especially with the fact that a lot of our communities are 
becoming more and more non-indigenous if you will uh, when we say indigenous health it's just health we it's just health and it just happens to be that we're indigenous peoples indigenous issues oh my goodness i cannot stand that we are not an issue most of them are white issues to be frank <laughs> we're not indigenous issues whatsoever i just steer clear completely from that term so i think uh, the way we speak is is really important, mm -hmm. but the thing that's more important is to be uh, more uh, okay with asking questions, more okay with being wrong, more okay with making a mistake, especially as a non-Indigenous person, especially as a white person. In a lot of situations, uh, a white individual is the safest person in that situation when as a a minority or a racialized or a colored individual, if we're going to try and get more heated and stand for ourselves, we're often just putting ourselves more in danger. We really have to navigate what that what's going on in that situation. Whereas if we had a white person step in, you know, that can actually really, really calm things down. So I think uh, making sure that uh, you're, you're speaking, you know, with intention and mm -hmm. recognizing what you're, privilege can be and, and exercising that uncomfortable. Um, it can be uncomfortable to put yourselves in conversations or situations, but imagine what that's like for Indigenous peoples every day of our life to be continuously uh, worried. I mean, for me, I didn't even really think about, you know, in my head, it was security's job is to protect everybody and to, you know, let me do my job, but ultimately to protect everyone. And it finally got kind of laid out for me that, well, it's actually their job to ensure that they can have the members do their job, the Senate, that like the House of Commons can function. That is their job. And I was like, oh, so they were really, really out of line when they kept stopping me like that. But I was, but that's like a, an everyday situation for Indigenous what? people, for minority individuals. Like we don't think about you going to a store you're I mean I've been used to being followed around and you don't think about it because the world isn't built for you and and you got to learn how to function in it so for me it honestly like and and, and just timing and whatnot I didn't want to distract from from what I was really trying to do and advocate for my constituents for Nunavut mute and I I really didn't realize though how out of line and how much that reflected the broken system, how much, um, you know, we hear uh, the excuses from the federal institution, like um, we, how do we, and, and we have these conversations, like how do we fix systemic racism? Well, take my example, you give training to that security on racial profiling, on not being intimidating to tiny little racialized women as a big security guard and you mimic those kinds of practices those policies and procedures in the rcmp bam <laughs> like you're you're starting to make progress and movement um there there is power in in doing that and exactly like you said you can't how do you heal in a place where you, where you continue to get hurt or you have been hurt and unfortunately for a lot of Northerners, for a lot of Indigenous peoples, that's exactly the case. That's why basic human rights is so important, where when we're talking about housing and Nunavut Mute have one in three people living in an overcrowded home, well, how many of these people are living with their abusers, are forced to be in situations where they're not safe, where they can't be healthy, where they can't continuously go to school to learn because there's not enough food on the table. Seven out of 10 children go hungry to school hungry um, in Nunavut. So we, we know all these devastating things. There's a reason for them. There's a history behind them. It's frankly the federal institutions. It, they've been on quite the mission to ensure that Indigenous people were first attempted to be assimilated and now continue to not be taken taken care of. I, I don't like that phrase. Uh, to be uh, given basic human rights, I should say. Uh, to be given that uh, that uh, equality and that justice, and in in my term and through through my barely uh, year and a half or two, I really realized that I 
didn't have a shot at the right to self-determination and that was really really hard for me to and and still is in a way really have really hard for me to wrap my head around because I realized that uh, as much as I wouldn't change my life or anything in it and I and I love where I am and who I'm becoming it's not where I would have been if there wasn't so much turmoil and violence and poverty around me growing up I was forced in a position where it's unfortunately your norm to learn how to talk people out of suicide or to hold your breath during Christmas time because there have been years where there's four in a row in less than two months where you're, I mean, I go to the graveyard every time I'm home to go visit more than, you know, I don't want to name numbers because we all got, we all got stuff. We all got people we've lost we've all got friends peers family members there's so much hurt everywhere uh, we're we're forced to learn how to uh, first survival mode and then if we can if we're privileged enough to to be in that space how can we help other people that aren't how can we uh, do the best to our ability to support as many other people um, that that we can, and especially as Inuit, as Indigenous peoples, there's such a community and family orientation to a lot of our, our lifestyles that it was that kind of obligation of you need to help because you're in a position of, of privilege. You're not looking out to just survive and make it day to day, so help as many people uh, as you can around you. So in that, I started coaching. I played quite a few sports. I've been coaching since I was 17. I did hockey, soccer, basketball, ping pong, um, and um, you know, had a lot of fun with the youth. And that was my way of giving back. But if I didn't feel like maybe I, I had to be in, in that position all the time, maybe I would have pursued. Um, I was so into zoology and animals and I wanted, I was so dead set I was going to be a zookeeper for a bit. Um, I was going to be an archaeologist. I was going to be a fashion designer. And I very well, like, I'm, that's what I'm coming back to, uh, finding those those passions and those things that truly make me happy. And for the first time in my 27 years, deciding it's time to be selfless, a little bit selfish. I, I can't even, I almost said self. I don't know how to say the word. Um, because it's it goes against, um, what I've known for the last 27 years and um, but um, back on I, I guess allyship and and I think it's important that people um, also really realize that for for me to get where I am is absolutely crazy my grandfather lived out on the land and lived a good part of his life on the land my dad was born on the land and brought into town and um, you know and then somehow they produced me somehow in two generations they went from a completely different way of living completely ripped from what they known forced into all these other kinds of things and somehow still still made me um, so I think it just goes to show all the strength and resilience that uh, Indigenous people and Inuit are forced into. Um, mm -hmm. Let's be reminded of, of that. Um, but I think allies need to need to know that history and, and have an awareness that this is, um, has been something in the works. This has been something that uh, ideations, these ideologies have been alive and well uh, in Canada for, for a long time. And I think, okay, Cancel Canada Day is, is one thing, but why don't we make it a, a big thing? Why don't we change the meaning of what Canada Day is? Why don't we share these histories? Why don't we enforce these calls to action? Why don't we demand justice for these atrocities? That's what people can do. People can call on the Justice Department, on the Minister of Justice, the federal institution has so many documents, so many documents. You know, they keep pointing the finger at the Catholic Church. They have, they have a ton just as well. And, and that's the thing. We, we allow 
this institution that's supposed to be helping our country um, make these decisions that clearly don't, uh, mm -hmm. that clearly benefit the, the rich and wealthy that, you know, we had, we had crazy things happening in COVID. We had crazy decisions being made. We had political, uh, political chips being pulled. We had people getting vaccines before others that didn't really make sense. We had lockdowns in place that weren't scientific. Like we were in a pandemic. We, had... oh man, I'm getting fired up. We, this institution though, is supposed to help run things, not make decisions that benefit itself. Mm -hmm. And that's unfortunately what the institution does. I think people don't realize what power they have have in themselves. And I'll give you a, a hard example I think people really need to hear too. Um, uh, so Nunavut has the highest suicide rate uh, in Canada at times in the world. Uh, if you look at Inuit Nunavut as a whole, there are extremely high rates. Uh, Nunavik in, in northern Quebec, I believe, has higher rates at times than Nunavut. It's, um, it's everybody in the territory is affected in, in one way or another, uh, whether it's uh, friend, family. Um, we, and, and we all know each other. All of our communities are isolated, only fly in, fly out, mm -hmm. are um, about uh, average 2,000. Iqaluit is the biggest at about 8,000. The next biggest community is Aghbeh, which is about 3,000. All the other 23 are under that number, small, small, isolated communities. So when something happens, we're, we're all affected. So um, there's a number of things that have happened in uh, Inuit lifestyle, if you will, in, in the changes of our, our society. And a number of those things are residential school or boarding school. Uh, another one that's unique or specific, I should say, to the Inuit experience is the dog slaughters that prevented men from going um, hunting, uh, prevented them from fulfilling what their role typically was within the family and uh, moved, forced into communities, moved into what Inuit called matchbox houses weren't given their own names, instead were given identification disks or e-numbers. Some people call them dog tags. Um, I think my eldest aunt and my grandparents both have, uh, there's lots of people that still have and know their e-numbers. So uh, government officials were basically too lazy to learn <laughs> how to write uh, and pronounce the Inuktitut names properly. And instead of giving people names, they gave them numbers. And uh, that's how they tracked a lot of Inuit. And Inuit still talk about getting their Service Canada email with their name, but also their identification number attached to it. So these kinds of things uh, were happening uh, were being forced on Inuit. And in these services at the time, uh, they were done in English. They were done in a way that didn't make sense in Inuit culture, whether it be food, whether it be, I mean, to me, it's normal. For example, you walk into a home, you don't knock at the door because who knocks? Who started knocking at first in homes? Inuit didn't have doors. Who started the knock? The RCMP. So when you hear a knock at a door, for mm -hmm. me, that's an alarm bell. That's not a, a we, we just, as Inuit, you just walk into a home typically. <laughs> and so there are these kinds of what people might think are little things, these very, very big differences. And on so many different scales, there were so many uh, different levels of abuse uh, uh, that happened in all of these things. So back to how policy and procedure really influenced um, uh, one of these things. In 1983, there were a lot of people, a lot of white people on um, Parliament Hill. Uh, they were protesting the white sealskin coat and they wanted to stop the slaughter on uh, seals. And for Inuit, that's basically the the exchange of the, the money, your, your, your resource, your survival, your what you depend on. It's your clothing, your food, your shelter. Um, a seal is so key in, in the culture. And 
So a, a bunch of white people were protesting to to stop this uh, seal skin, basically mm-hmm. just didn't want uh, white coats to to be killed anymore. And there is there is a little line. There was a little line in there, basically that said this exempts Inuit and and that traditional hunting. But what that did was send the seal skin market completely crashing and keeping in mind all of these other things were happening at the time being forced into community with your dogs being killed you might be taken away or your parents for tb treatment maybe you're just started going to school uh, and all of these things happening within your community you have maybe the ability to hunt if you're one of your communities is on the coast now and if you look at the khitani truth commission uh, you can see very, very clearly how the federal institution made Inuit dependent on them. So with all these things happening, what the government also did was basically give out social assistance. And you can see in a chart from, I believe it's 1950 to 1951, how that was your highest level of income people were making money off social assistance at about twenty four thousand dollars a year the next way that people were able to make money at about i believe uh eighty three hundred dollars a year so almost a third of that Mm -hmm. was by hunting was with their skins now all of a sudden the seal skin market came crashing down because this white coat bank came into play i was in Uh, to start the campaign when I uh, had decided to run it's my dad's hometown I'd never been there before and um, I don't really know my um, my dad's grandparents died um, very early and um, it um, we were at the graveyard to go see his dad and, and a lot of other people of course and he goes I remember in 1984 so and so that was the first suicide and then he just, and then it was so and so and so and so and so and And he's not an emotional man. And he started tearing a little bit. And he took a breath and he was like, and I just stopped counting. And I just felt like intense chills because it was like, oh my goodness, the white coat band came crashing. And that was like, in my mind, that, that last blow to the role of man, like the role of man in community, in family, was getting taken away, taken away, taken away by the federal institution, by churches, by the RCMP. And to me, it was just like that last one thing that Inuit had. And all of a sudden, that economic opportunity wasn't there. So I, to me, that was, um, you know, directly shows you how this policy, this external policy forced onto a group of people had devastating impacts and continues to. And what we're seeing is a historical ongoing mistreatment for Inuit and Indigenous people. And so much so that so many Inuit just are continuing to struggle to make day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month. So it's it's hard to turn around and say, how, how do you explain to allies how they can help when first you got to understand there's all this lead up all this stuff all this history there's there's a reason why it is the way it is and why should it be up to us to unravel educate explain Mm -hmm. and and turn around and figure out for you almost so i i think it's really important for people to educate themselves and figure out really what What is their ability? What is their comfort? And really explore within them what is their, your your own self. Like you really got to know your own self um, to to be a, I don't want to say a good ally, but like an an active good ally maybe. Um, And it's that like constantly asking questions and learning how to do it in a respectful way in a place and time probably the first question you should always ask is if can I go find this information myself (laughs) it's probably always the first one you should ask um but I think it's it's time that we we have these conversations I think that people are more open to and and wanting to hear the experiences, but they also need to understand there's a lot of 
there is a lot out there already. There's a lot mm -hmm. of documentation. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of all the calls to action. It's out there. Um, the truth, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the Qayyidani Truth Commission, like start with those and get back to me in a year if you finished. Um, there is so, so much information in there. And then even those linked to so many other documents. Uh, there are so many court cases, Google court cases. Um, figure out what indigenous lands are in your area. Um, I, I think it's it's such an odd thing to kind of say, well, what do you think you need to I'm like, okay, if somebody else is asking me how they can support, well, it's like, I don't know you. How how am I supposed to tell you how, I don't know your life. How yeah. do you, how am I supposed to know what you can do, <laughs> what your ability is? That's really fair. And I think yeah. that a lot of people uh, don't realize that a lot of uh, Indigenous people, a lot of Inuit, uh, a lot of minorities we're trying to figure it out too we're trying to figure out where our place is and and how far we are uh in pushing ourselves how comfortable we are in doing that um, so i think it's it takes a lot of reflecting a lot of um asking your own self questions before you go around and start asking others well i think everything you're saying is just uh I mean, I feel, I, I'm thinking about how you framed that language component and how we have to change the way we talk and stop framing these issues as indigenous issues and more about like, these are Canadian issues about like, of like violations of human rights. Um, and the community that is disproportionately affected by this by and large is indigenous communities. But now like, and I think we all as non-indigenous folk and like as settlers, have to sit and go, okay, this is not meant, this discussion, this space, this environment, we're not supposed to feel comfortable about that. There's nothing comfortable about these conversations. They, it's hard work. Um, and we have to lean into that discomfort and be like, okay, like the bare minimum is sitting with the discomfort. Um, what comes next is action. And what I keep reminding people when we get DMs about, and what our team is always reminding people about is that there's a cheat sheet for the government, like they have the 94 calls to action that they could take action on to make a change. It's not like we have to sit and wonder how, how do we be better? It's already written out there. So let's act on that. And why isn't it something we're acting on? I think um, if it was any other, if it was Ontario that had the highest suicide rate in the world and the country, um, we like, things would change right away. Um, why is it that it isn't changing? And what does that say about our country if that's what we're doing? And how do we sit here and look at each other and like now in this moment when we all know better, how do we do better? Because it can't just go back to like performative actions. Like that just isn't gonna work. Um, it's, I think like a lot of people have been commenting here about how sad they are to see you leave, um, like I guess the House of Commons and leaving your role as a member of parliament. And I feel, like sad is not the right thing. I'm like furious that you have to leave. If that's like not at you, but at the system for existing like that, that you don't feel safe to be able to advocate and do the job that you were elected to do. I'm infuriated that it's not a safe environment that like what you said in that speech where you said something along the lines of like, you know, you encourage us to run, but when we show up, um, it's like, it's not you're, like, we're just there to be there. Like it's like, it, what's the point of telling people like anyone can run anyone can be a leader anyone can represent their their, uh, their community but when you show up no one listens to you um it's like a, almost like the myth of a free government or a myth of a democracy if these systems and these structures are not actually working the way that we were taught in that civics course that we all took in high school you know that like everything's fair and equal and lovely and it's not so now what do we do? How do we demand better of our electoral system? How do we demand better of our representatives? And I think the first part is realizing like personally, it's that this is an ongoing fight now. Um, and we have to all show up and, and be there. And we can't just let this go back to the way it was. Like I, 
I, I'm really terrified of a country that knows better but doesn't do better. Because right now, for the, you know, you know, like we all are aware in a way that we've never known before, partly because of ignorance, partly because we didn't look into it ourselves, and partly because it was designed for us not to know more about it. But now that we all know it, how are you going to do better? And how are you going to do, dif- do it differently is like the question I challenge our community and non-Indigenous people as a whole. This isn't about us and our experience. This is about showing up in a way that the past never did um, to, to course correct dramatically. And doing that while centering Indigenous voices, while centering the, like, the, the like, cheat sheet of the reconciliation report that gives you the 94 calls to action. Um, we can't go back to a world in which that's not part of everything that we're doing and everything that we're thinking about because then nothing changes. Uh, and I don't, I don't think that's what we should want. I think we should want better. Um, and we should want to do better. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I know that we, I know you're probably like super busy, so I don't want to take up too much of your time, but um, as we sort of round up at the the end of our of our chat, um, I guess, what do you think we should? As I guess, like, what do you think we should all be looking into? What do you think we should all be doing? What are sort of some closing thoughts? I just want to create space for you, like, share whatever you want to share here, because um, I feel like I'm learning so much, and I'm sure our community here is learning too. And yeah. I think there's a number of things we can touch on. I do want to, yes, I am drinking from a spaghetti jar. These are my water cups. I've seen that come up quite a bit, and it is a spaghetti jar. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I think that's that's the thing that, I think that's the thing that is probably most frustrating for a lot of people that it feels like, well, what, what do we do? So what do we do? We know this now. How do we make it better? How do we do better? Wow. How do we fulfill uh, our roles as, as allies? Uh, and there is an, a feeling of urgency to act. And I think the conversation really gets muddled by, by media and, and we really miss um, miss the mark in in some things um there's a lot of things that people can do i think well one of the most easy things that you can do is show up to vote you can go and vote and be a part of that and go be a part of selecting your representative go vote for someone who is gonna do something or i mean i know that's I mean, that's harder to say. And I just, I come from a certain party. I would never run for every, any other one. I don't believe in any other party. I don't agree with any other party. I could rant and rant and rant about all the other parties in non-pleasant ways. So I would just I would say, you know, <laughs> vote for for Orange. But um, you know, when, when you are voting, vote for who you think is really going to create change, who is going to especially have the ability to represent yourself and your constituency in a way that's truthful. Mm. I mean, we should have been able to see this come out 20 years ago. Why does it take a 27-year-old Enoch woman to come in and and start rattling things up? Um, Why I think that's the, the restrictions you see from from other parties and that historical mistreatment with indigenous peoples, that relationship has never been good. It continues to not be good. Uh, So why would we uh, elect those kinds of people? Um, So being a part of that process is something that right away um, people can do. But I think people also don't realize that they can continue to use their voice even with their representatives. Your representatives are there to represent you. I cannot stress to you how seriously I take my job and how much like my staff are calming me down and like basically it's okay to breathe sometimes and it's okay to take a break it's okay to because this job is so important to me I came in to uh, represent and try and bring a voice that uh, was amplified in ways we haven't seen and 
you don't see that from many other MPs, you know, you come, you see other MPs coming in and making deals for themselves and setting themselves mm. up. Um, you, you can see those kinds of things right off the bat, but as your representative, you can also hold them accountable for that. Um, constituents have uh, so much power and ability to make change. Uh, I'll give you uh, an example. I was on the prop committee the uh, committee that kind of sees the oversees the procedures, if you will, of the House of Commons. And uh, my colleague, Daniel Blakey, sits on it. And we were, uh, I was presenting an amendment to Bill C-19 that talks to the election, an election happening during COVID. And I was trying to get this uh, bill to say, uh, to adopt uh, an amendment to say, let's have indigenous languages on the ballot so we can ensure that indigenous peoples are able to, to vote in their language. What the committee has the power to do, the PROC committee has the power to do is to determine if something is within scope or out of scope of something. So this amendment I had proposed to a bill that talked about an election, they said it was not in scope. They wouldn't even talk about it. Because I showed up, I was able to say, excuse me, Chair, can I just have a moment to say, say a few things? And uh, she was kind enough uh, to let me. And um, so I said, thank you. Thank you all. And thank you all for showing each and every single Indigenous person, every single Canadian, that reconciliation is just a lip service. You're here with the power and ability to say this is in scope. You legit can all sit here and say, yes, this is in scope. Let's at least talk about it. And you won't even do that because clearly you're not making decisions for yourself. You should have seen some of the MPs like curl and clearly like, no, they weren't making the right decision in saying, yes, this is out of scope. But what did that do? That created a whole lot of heat from the public. There were a whole lot of people angry, rightfully so, and a whole lot of people started talking to their MPs. A whole lot of people started emailing, writing, tweeting, you name it. And um, I think one of the members actually was like, oh, are you getting heat on social media too about this? So now I believe there are discussions in adopting something similar in this committee to do a study on indigenous languages on the ballot, even though they all agreed it should already be happening. It should already be something that's in place. Um, so it just, you know, goes to show how these kinds of things work. It's about it's about a power imbalance, a power trip. It's about uh, getting the public aware of how something like this can uh, create change. Like people yeah. put pressure onto the liberal government and now the liberal government is saying oh okay now we got to talk about it now people are are making us talk about it this is something that's important so you know people just emailing writing uh tweeting all those kinds of things is something that's really helpful your representatives are there to represent you and if they're not doing their job tell them tell them you're not happy with with what they're doing uh keep up with and, and that's why i i mean it's <laughs> It's hard, I think, because um, politics is, is not for for everyone, I guess. And that's exactly what I would have said until October or uh, August, rather, 2019. And uh, but it does really impact uh, so much it, as an Indigenous person. At the moment I'm born, it impacts my life as an, you know, every single thing that happens in that institution directly impacts my life and everyone around me extremely, extremely severely uh, because of that historical piece. Um, for people that are, are more privileged, it might not be as, uh, as mm -hmm. a concern because the system works for you. Uh, the system, or maybe not works, but works better. Uh, or, yeah. Um, yeah, I can't even say works. I don't know what word to you functions well enough for you <laughs> yeah. but uh might not function it doesn't function for indigenous people um, it doesn't work for indigenous people so i think it's it's really important that people uh, learn more about themselves what their comfort is what uh, where where they come from too i think it's something not to shy away from um as indigenous 
peoples is so important to me. Um, you know, where I, I come from is really important. To be open about that to me is really important. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not a, uh, if we're going to start having conversations, we need to start talking about uh, where we're coming from and, and who we are and, and what privileges we hold. I hold an immense amount of privilege in my position, um, but me standing next to uh, somebody like, uh, you know, say Charlie Angus, um, you know, that's that's a very different situation. I've had yeah. conversations with many of my white colleagues to say, uh, I remember actually one very specific, oh, um, when we knock, do you get stopped by security? And I was like, um, you mean like just now on the way in? Yeah. And they're like, yeah, doesn't surprise me. I mean, I'm a old white dude and I'd never get stopped. And we laughed about it because they're right. I can have those honest, frank conversations within my party and call those kinds of things out um, right there in the systems. And, and we know, unfortunately, that's uh, a direct uh, reflection, I think, of Canada. And I think people... Yeah also need to to realize um that in in my experience and sharing that it's just one privileged one it's one um that comes from i th i think an immense amount of aware uh an, um, an immense amount of awareness uh an immense amount of um reality <laughs> reality check or willingness to, I guess, speak the truth. Um, but could you imagine if you had somebody in here with the right to self-determination that if that decided when they were, you know, I think of Leslie Nope, oh my goodness, I'm obsessed with Parks and Rec, um, <laughs> who job. thought when they were like five wanted to be a politician. And if that, you know, had the right to self-determination that they could pursue that, could you imagine somebody being in here that really wanted to pursue that that was so passionate about uh, being a member of parliament like they'd be five billion times <laughs> more than than I could be and um, I'm I'm in here because really I, I took whatever opportunity I could in my life to help as many in need as I can and it's one that came my way and I don't bite off more than I can chew. I run after the alive animal and I try to take it down myself. Like I've, I've just always been like that. Um, but I've always also been a very honest and real and transparent person and right. uh, not willing to not share that. Inuit and Indigenous people have been straight lied to our whole relation with the federal institution, with the RCMP continued to be lied to. And I can't you know, shy away from, from truth. I can't not tell um, that reality. And I understand why people um, might be upset with my decision to not run, but it, uh, you know, in, in my time and what time we have left, I hope we have another two, could you, we have, we have the potential to have another two years. Like we still have the potential to have lots and lots of time in here. Um, and uh, just being forced to talk about an election. And it's just to say, um, I'm just deciding not to do it again. I can still complete a term and still uh, be able to do that. And that, you know, we're going to talk a whole, we can have a whole other thing about the power of media and all. And oh, even that, and they're talking about, I did not resign, did not resign, just not running again. Um, and even I thought about how interesting that is in that experience um how the media was pairing me up with a block uh block story and i was like oh goodness please please do not compare <laughs> the experience of inuit to a member from the block but that's just how this country thinks it's okay to function to talk yeah. to engage to I was like, oh my goodness, in no way, shape or form is, how could you even put these side by side did not make sense to me. But that's also, you know, the media needs to be held accountable, accountable too, um, for their how they decide to use their words and actions. Um, 
So I, I think that people, you know, people don't realize how much influence that they do have. There, there is power in its numbers. Oh my goodness, we saw the Black Lives Matter movements that happen internationally. We saw yeah. things happen worldwide. It, and I, ooh, I just got goosebumps when I said it. But it took, because it, it took a Black man dying in front of the world in that horrific way like why did it have to get to that point why do we have to get to these extremes before we mm -hmm. decide that we're ready for right we're ready for action we're ready for justice how many more you know we need to kill themselves before the federal government decides oh these people need access to water affordable healthy food and a place to a place to live a place to sleep every night if you can't put your head down and rest like how can you function as a normal human being and one in three people live in an overcrowded home just just think about overcrowding alone and then there are all these uh, horrific atrocities that continue to to happen um in Nunavut uh, i mean RCMP uh, shot, shoot, Inuit, I'm trying to remember the exact year, a Thomas uh, Rohner uh, journalist did a really good story on it um, at 14.3 times the rate of Ontario police, uh, Nunavut, uh, Nunavut RCMP, mm -hmm. um, were shooting Inuit and uh, women experience, um, you know, three times the rate of violence. There's all these numbers that I can ring off and ring off and ring off. How do you help people when they don't have a space, when you don't have a room, you don't have a bedroom, you're on a waiting list for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, it's, it's hard. It's hard when it feels like you're put into hopelessness. Uh, you're put into um, a spot that the country doesn't care about you. It's hard uh, when the, you're really, really shown the country doesn't, um, ooh, I shouldn't say the country, the federal institution doesn't, um, doesn't value you as a human being. And I think now that we know uh, some of these things, the country can show us that they care. Mm -hmm. And in that, force the federal institution into doing something. Um, people are dying. People are there was a man just pulled out of a shack fire in a Kaluit a few weeks ago. There was a man last fall that died in a shack fire. Like people are dying all the time because they don't have a place to live because they don't have safety because they don't have a place to put their head down at night. And that's from forced relocation. That's from dog slaughters. That's from those matchbox houses in the 1970s. That's not seeing that obligation and that fulfillment of responsibility the federal institution should be should be doing and uh, it's time for our allies to realize that they have power in themselves and um, in their numbers we can't do this by ourselves uh, we need that support we need that extra voice we need to be amplified we need to be um, supported and mm -hmm. and people can do that by calling on the um the Justice Department. They have records. Don't let them say, well, we're, the, we're gonna you know, tell the Catholic Church they should do this. They're never gonna make them even though they can. And they have, they have the papers. They have the papers right there on, on the Hill. They have documentation there. They know who these perpetrators are. They know who these predators are. They know who is some of these people who should be in jail and aren't. They know who they are. And there are so many names there uh, where we'll be looking into, you know, some really, really solid um, information and numbers, but they're there. There's mm -hmm. so many um, ways that the, the feds give that excuse. They have it. They, and they have the power to do things. Uh, and they do the most when there is national, and, uh, if not uh, international pressure. And when we look at um, doing things for Indigenous people, uh, unfortunately, whether it's good or bad, but we need national, national pressure, absolutely. Everybody's voices to say this isn't right. 
and it needs to be made right. People deserve basic human rights. We're not talking about anything crazy here. We're talking about Mm -hmm. affordable living, clean drinking water, and safe spaces. We're not asking for anything crazy, basic human rights. I think what you said about the media um, too is really important because earlier this year, um, like a white woman named Sarah Everdeen, I think, I I might be saying her name wrong, was missing and, uh, and killed in the UK and internationally it sparked a discussion. And I remember reading that and being like, oh my God, like in Canada, we have missing and murdered Indigenous women and two spirit and girls and two spirited folk who are being killed on a regular basis, but it's just not making the news. So it's there's no international outcry around it. And I think that's the difficulty with this is that a lot of these institutions perpetuate these colonial white supremacy based mentalities where other issues are not covered. And I think like this might not be the right way of saying it, but I feel like to a certain degree, there are gonna be politicians hoping that this moment passes and doesn't become a movement so that they can go back to the status quo. And if that like, like to me that like devastates my soul. And if that's what people watching this are also feeling like that's not okay. They don't get to like wait us out and then move on to the way that they've always done things in a way that just benefits one dominant culture in this this country, um, then, keep making noise about it, keep tweeting about it, keep talking about it. Like on July 1st, if you've got family who are celebrating Canada Day, have a compassionate conversation with them. Tell them why that's problematic and why this year of all years that we need to, like we're in a period of national mourning. I know no one has like called it that, but I'm done waiting for the government to call things. I don't think that's going to happen. So I think this is a period of national mourning and it's in, it's disrespectful, it's insensitive to celebrate a day when when we know what we know now. Um, and, I, and I think in our post, we say this too, we're not saying don't get see your friends and family. We know that this year has been difficult. We know that mental health is important. Being able to, if you have a day off, being able to see people like and gather is good, but don't do it around like, yay, Canada, do it around, I'm excited to see people again and I'm not celebrating this day. It It's such a, it's the bare minimum, but starting these discussions um, and keeping these discussions going is what's going to force their hand. Um, I don't want to, like, I don't want to go back to normal. We know too much now. Um, the status quo didn't work. It hasn't worked. It's historically been causing violence and harm. We need a change. And I genuinely believe that there are so many millennials and Gen Z and even other generations as well who really see this as a possibility. It's like the change needs to happen, we need to do it. But we, don't, we feel like kind of overwhelmed with the idea that there's like so much to do. How do you, how do you combat, combat a historical colonial structure like the federal institution? Um, step one is just to keep this discussion going and not letting them off the hook. They work for us, the, the government is supposed to work for the people, not the other way around. And it, that's not just some people, that's supposed to be all of us. Um, yeah, I just, I just think that we have to keep demanding better or we're going to, nothing will change. Um, with, I, like, I, I, I'm so happy to have had you here today. I know, I know we kept you way longer than uh, we had originally discussed. Thank you so much for being generous with your time. Um, please know that if you're ever wanting to use this platform or, you know, chat with us again, I feel like there's so much stuff that you brought up that I was like, I want to talk about it. But like, I also want to be mindful of your time. Um, But these are like, this is something our project has continued to, is committed to continuing a conversation around around what non-Indigenous people can do. It's not a moment to us, it's a movement. And it's something that has to shift because everyone should have access to basic human rights, especially in a country as wealthy as Canada is. Um, there's really no excuse why we, why it's like that other than racism. So um, yeah, like let's demand better and we get to be that change. We get to be the future. We can't, we can't change the past, but we can be better now. Um, and I really want to invite people into that. I know it's uncomfortable, but, uh, and hard work, but it's a necessary step and no one else is going to take it for us. Um, 
do you have any final things to say before we wrap up? Um, I'm, I'm really grateful to have shared space with you today. Um, I'm inspired by you and I, I, yeah, I just think you're incredible. Yeah. Um, thanks for, for the space. I think, um, it's been great conversation. And of course, there of course, <laughs> so many things that um, we can uh, really dive into. And uh, I think people will challenge people to two things, um, to read uh, part, at least one of the community reports from the Truth Commission, the QTC. It's a um, similar to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report in the way that it's structured, but it focuses on 13 specific communities in Nunavut mm -hmm. and um, to keep up with where these graves are being found because all we've heard are mostly two numbers. There's a lot more out there. There's, I can't stress um, enough that it's brown bodies with names, with families, with spirits, with you know, that should have had futures that they didn't. And I knew as soon as there was going to be an announcement, um, I, uh, I, have a, I have a great team. I have great staff. We meet every morning. And I said, these aren't just kids. They're not just babies. They're not just three or five-year-olds. There's 10-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 25-year-olds, probably 40-year-olds in there. There's, the point is these are all brown bodies. These are all us. And people can't forget that these numbers we keep hearing over in these places, indigenous people we've known since they've been there, um, for some of it, uh, not in its entirety. And even that, there's an injustice there. There's uh, people still don't know exactly where their loved ones are except they're not home they're not resting where they should be they haven't had the culture practices or space given that they've been denied that over and over and indigenous people are are tired of kind of this um you know let's move into action let's move into it's great it, it's great don't get me wrong but it's hard. I feel like we're, I don't know how to describe it, except ripping open a plague. We're, we're ripping open the colonization plague and uh, there's so much darkness and hurt that's going to come from this. There's a lot of communities that struggle really, really immensely with mental health. Um, I'm scared of the, the, the spikes in suicide we're going to see. I'm scared of uh, a, a lot of turmoil and, and substance abuse increase. Um, I'm scared of people feeling that their this hurt of theirs was just ripped out for the nation to see and yet there's still no clean water, there's still no job opportunities, there's still no access to culture, access to mental health. It's great that people want things to happen, but we have to remember what exactly it is we're doing here. And that's we're not just trying to correct a wrong or fulfill an injustice, but we're trying to help people heal and we're trying to help people decide to stay alive. We're trying to help people overcome whatever darkness they and their family had to go through and that there are still people alive that saw this that went through this that see it in their head all the time that it's it's not something that happened a long time ago it's not something that um is a discussion to say we just need to fight we also need to take time to realize that these are, if, if we can't shift from the idea that brown bodies don't hold stereotypes and assumptions that we know uh, that they do, 
um, that we can't change the narrative. We really have to focus on the conversation of humanizing who these people are. These are our these are indigenous people. These are the first peoples of this country. These are who should be, in my mind, on on walls and a part of our sports games. And like, why don't why don't we know anything about indigenous peoples? Um, it's truly it's truly heartbreaking. Um, the stereotypes and assumptions we allow to to continue and um again going back to conversation i think that's the we're we're really we're really not um we have barely touched the truth aspect let alone reconciliation and i don't think we can really get to reconciliation until we talk about all the really 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 hard things um and people are hurting people are feeling people are angry and upset but a lot of people are, and um, there also needs to be a space of, of support and, and not just in a way where um, there's more anger or friction created, but also where there's that love and accepting too. Um, so as much as I, I want you to go and you know demand action and go and participate in protests and, and write those emails, I want you to also learn about the indigenous peoples around you and the land around you and what those cultures are to, again, knowing yourself as an ally is so important to understand where it's okay to ask questions, um, to uh, create space that is open and human and is just it's about learning and i think uh, we need to have those two things hand in hand where we have the humanizing and we have that demand for justice um just as much we have to remember that um this is uh, yeah i don't know how else to explain it. it to me it feels like a plague and we we really are ripping open it's just starting to to really get into it and uh, i hope people can realize that um Along the way, there needs to be a lot of a lot of healing, a lot of support, and a lot of positivity in that too. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and um, reminding us of the work that has to be done, but also how holistic that has to look. It can't just be um, taking action; it has to be paired with understanding where you exist right now and understanding yourself in the space. And that's something like I've been really looking into and it's been really fascinating and um, yeah, I think it's just to keep doing that work. So thank you so much. Um, I'm so uh, grateful to you and um, thanks to everyone for sticking on. I know it was longer than we said, but I think it was a great discussion and I'm so, so, so uh, grateful to you. So thank you so much. Um, we'll, you. we'll chat again soon. I'm sure. Yes. Sounds great. Thank you, Samantha. Take care. Bye. Bye now.